I'm Sean Carolyn, Solutions Engineer with HashiCorp, and um, I'm based out of Austin, Texas. And I'm Dylan Silva. I'm the Product Manager for Ansible Engine, or Ansible Core, or just Ansible Project, whatever you want to call it. And I'm out of this fair Bay Area of San Francisco. All right. <laughs> so today we're going to present to you our, our musings on the subject of how our tools work better together. Yeah, so, it, you know, a lot of you and a lot of our users pretty much like the Pegasus as an either-or story. And our goal here is to really tell you how these two tools or how the HashiCorp suite of tools and the Ansible suite of tools are really very synergistic with each other. And uh, pretty much just kick back, enjoy the ride with us, and kind of hear us, our, our mutterings amongst ourselves um, on how these work together. How many folks in the room today are using Terraform? OK, good. And then keep your hands up. How many of you are actually Ansible users as well? Wow. All right, so okay. good fair amount. Nice. So I'll apologize in advance. I got a boring slide coming, but we'll get past through that one yeah. pretty quickly. We'll try to spice it up. <clears throat> All right, so the first question, why? Well, we look at it this way. From Red Hat Ansible automation side, which really is the culmination of Engine, Tower, Galaxy, Ansible Vault, it's, it's how do we take that tool set and take the community that comes from it and extend it out to the rest of the ecosystem. So occasionally you'll hear us mention Ansible is the glue of, of all that is automation, all that is the, you know, the DevOps tool ecosystem that we all work with. Well, Taking that step back, Ansible doesn't necessarily have to own and do every single task that it's set out to do. So being that glue or being the orchestrator, think of it as the composer of a nice symphonic piece, we can reach out and tell other tools and work with other tools to do the task that it's best suited for. So we're not that big instrument that owns the whole piece. There are other instruments that can do the job better than us or can actually do it in a sense that we wouldn't actually be able to tackle it with. So that being said. Today we'll be showing you how three different HashiCorp tools can benefit the Ansible user. First we'll take a look at how HashiCorp Vault, our secrets management product, and how it compares to Ansible Vault. Next we'll show you how Ansible can be combined with Terraform or Packer to enable powerful and efficient build pipelines. There are many products and uh, projects that contain Vault in their name. Um, when you think of a Vault, you might think of a giant you know, safe in a bank, the big door, and you can lock your secrets inside of the Vault. HashiCorp Vault can certainly be used to store your secrets, but it can also generate new secrets or even encrypt your data on the fly. Think of a modern, multi-cloud, distributed, API-driven secrets management engine. And we have a lot of those same concepts as well with our Ansible Vault. But we want to expand on this by saying a couple of things. HashiCorp Vault comes in both open source and enterprise versions. The Vault cluster can store secrets or generate dynamic credentials. Um, multiple authentication methods are possible, so Vault is easy to integrate with the provisioning and config management tools like Ansible or Terraform. And when we talk about Ansible Vault, it really is just a feature to us. It's a place where you can take protected, sensitive data and have it vaulted to use in a, in a playbook run. And that's pretty much it. When we think of places to secure, secure your passwords or tokens or other authentication methods, that's really something that HashiCorp Vault is really good for. And we actually suggest you users to, to push towards something like that. How many of you are using Ansible Vault today? Show of hands. OK, yep. good handful. Where do you store the password? Okay, we have a thing for that in case you need a place to store the password. <laughs> All right, so brief review. Some of this will be review for most of you. Um, what is Terraform? In case, in case any of you are brand new to Terraform, here's a real quick brief introduction. Uh, Terraform is an open source command line tool that can be used to provision any kind of infrastructure on dozens of different platforms and services. Terraform code is written in HCL, or the HashiCorp config language. You can see an example of that up here. HCL is easy to learn and easy to troubleshoot. It's meant to strike a balance between human-friendly and machine-readable code. 
With Terraform, you simply declare resources and how you want them configured, and then Terraform will map out the dependencies and build everything for you. In a moment, we'll show you a demo where Terraform stands up a server and then calls on Ansible to configure it. And then when we talk about Ansible, there's two things that we like to touch on. One, it's the project itself, the engine. That's what drives the automation forward for Ansible. And everything is perfectly described in that Ansible playbook, as you guys know. And then Tower, as the second part, is the framework that sits on top of the engine to drive that automation. So that is our, pretty much our glue between all of the different tools in the ecosystem to work together in har harmony. And then here is an example of a playbook for those of you that don't know it. I won't read it to you, but it's in YAML syntax. So very human readable as well. From top to bottom, runs tasks sequentially by default. So then moving forward, you can see all the different highlights of the things that make up a, a part of a playbook. So moving on to Terraform. We're back to Terraform. Does everybody know what this is? Yeah, this is a graph of uh, a bunch of Terraform code. So when you run Terraform, it very quickly and efficiently crawls through your code and puts everything in the correct order. I used a free uh, open source tool called Blast Radius to create this graph. When you run Terraform plan, it, it builds the graph before it actually goes and deploys your infrastructure. So this graph represents all the variables, resources, and dependencies required to stand up a single virtual machine in Azure. Now just imagine how complicated this can get when you need to stand up entire networks of machines, including load balancers and platform services. Terraform automatically maps out all these dependencies in the correct order for you. Let's talk about Packer. Who's using Packer today? All right, nice. Packer is the third HashiCorp tool that we mentioned. Packer builds machine images on different platforms. The modern op operations team is actually a software delivery team. And servers are no longer physical machines that you, you set up and build. Instead, they're software artifacts that we deliver with CI CD pipelines. Why might you want to build your images with Packer? Well, first of all, Packer's easy to use, and it works great with your existing Ansible code. It allows you to create security hardened images or pre install large software packages for quick uh, deployments or auto scaling. You can bake the latest OS patches into your images on multiple platforms, and you can ensure that the same OS image is being used on-prem and in the cloud. Our first use case here is building a simple Amazon machine image, or AMI as they're called, using Packer and Ansible. Packer works with all the major cloud platforms as well as VMware, OpenStack, and Docker. So we're gonna break here real quick to uh, a demo. Actually, we just saved the demo for the end, right? That might be better. Lost my slide. Maybe we'll put it back. Present. There we go. And we're back in business. We'll save the demo for the end. Of course, we need our notes now, too. Multi monitor, so fun. And we're back in business. All right. So here, I'll, I'll let you take this slide. Yeah, yeah. so the, the idea is, is basically taking the creation of any image and extending that next step onto Ansible. So the, the concept of configuring and making that beautiful golden image that we all look towards deploying in our environments, right? That's the step that Ansible can do for Packer when you're building that image. But oh. then the, uh, the concept that we'd also like to talk about is the little interweaving of it is Ansible working with Packer and telling Packer to take that step to build an image. So basically building an Ansible workflow to go through the process of building the golden image and then deploying it. I like to call this DevOpsception. So here's another use case. You can use Terraform to call Ansible. Yep. Terraform is a great infrastructure provisioning tool 
But you may have noticed it doesn't come with a config management system. That's where Ansible comes in. We use Terraform to stand up virtual machines or cloud instances, and then we hand over the reins to Ansible to finish up the configuration of our OS and applications. And then once again, Ansible calling Terraform. In Ansible 2.5, we released a Terraform module to do just that. So within that module, you can actually tell Terraform to run a plan to actually apply and set up your Terraformed environment right then and there. So going through that flow, you could start with Packer and then move on to Terraform all through one Ansible playbook. Speaking of DevOpsception, we have this so here you go. fun slide. This is the idea that we're trying to <laughs> to tell everybody, to we'll think see, about. It we'll doesn't if, have to be one or the other. Yeah, let's see if we can describe what's going on here. All right, so we have Ansible. Well, let's start with Packer. We have Packer calling Ansible to build our machine images. Those are going to live in the artifact repo. Then Ansible calls Terraform to build an instance or multiple instances from those images that we created. Along the way, you might fetch some secrets from Vault. And what happens next? Then we call Ansible again to finish configuring the machine to do any last mile config that you need to do to get it ready for production. So the two tools can actually be used you know, very, in a very complementary manner. So I think this is where you're pointing yeah. people to your, your actual Let's do the demo. demos and stuff. All right. So just a moment while we, I'm going to switch to mirrored mode so we don't have to play uh, window hide and seek here. It's always fun. Okay. How do I use Ansible with Terraform? Let's walk through that example first. Pretty standard Terraform code. We're standing up a, a Google Compute instance. And then with Terraform, we have the concept of a provisioner. The provisioner is the thing that's going to run your shell script or your Ansible code to finish configuring the OS and applications that live on the machine. You might notice that we have a remote exec, and it's just doing an echo command. Why would that be there? Well, the way you run Ansible with Terraform using local exec, um, if you don't have a remote exec in here, what will happen is the local exec attempts to run as soon as the machine is spun up. SSH isn't ready yet, and the command will fail. So this is a little bit of a hack that we use. The remote exec ensures that SSH is up and listening, and so we just run this little echo command, and you can put any command you want in there. And that way, once SSH is up, you can run your Ansible playbook the same way you always have. So local exec is one method to run Ansible on your machines using Terraform. And it's probably going to be the most comfortable and familiar if you're a longtime Ansible user. We're SSHing into the machine, and we're running our playbook, just like we always have. So I've got an example of that down here. I'll just go ahead and run it in my other terminal. So I see an Ansible cow. That's a good sign, right? That was a previous run, and as you know, if we, we run Terraform again, we get the same result. So I've deployed a simple cat app. I heard you can score internet points with cats, so we put a cat in our presentation. Second way you can run Ansible and Terraform together is using the remote exec method. How's the text size from the back? Can you folks read this? All this code is online, by the way. We'll give you the link, and that will be posted later. The remote exec can be handy when you don't have SSH access to the target host. So you need to run Ansible on that machine, but you might not be able to SSH to it directly. Um, or you, know, you may, not, may not be able to connect to it. We can use remote exec. You just have to figure out a way to get your playbooks onto the machine. So here I've kind of hacked together uh, some code that will push all of the Ansible code out there, install Ansible, and now we're running it from the remote host itself. So a little bit more work, but there are some use cases and scenarios where this could be handy. And then the final one is Packer. Packer is really easy to get started with. 
So if you're not using Packer today, um, go home and take it for a spin. You can take an existing playbook, drop it into a config file, and then you run your Packer command, as I've done here, Packer build, and you can see what happens. Packer spins up a new instance. Um, it'll even create a temporary key pair for you, so you don't have to worry about that or how to connect to the machine. It'll get on the machine, configure it, and then snapshot it into an image that you can use. And you can actually automate all of this, too, using a, like a CI, CD build pipeline or something. And this way, you have an image factory. Maybe you like to have the same version of Red Hat in both your cloud and your on-prem environments. Packer can enable that for you. So this is the code. This will be posted later if you want to um, get a copy of this. Also, we have tutorials on our website that explain how to use these two tools together. And uh, just real quick, too, we hadn't shown a demo on this, but from a HashiCorp vault side of things, oh, yes. Ansible, we provide a lookup plugin um, for those of you who don't know that exists. So you're able to take data out of HashiCorp vault and use it in your playbook runs as well. So there's uh, some documentation on that as well. Yeah, that's documented here. It's actually called the Hashi Vault plugin. Yep. And, works and I with see a, a lovely typo that we can get fixed right oh, there. Oh, so. you, you got good eyes. Yeah. All right. I think that I'm brings a stickler us, for that. Yeah. So that the, brings us to questions. Yeah. What questions? to keep it simple for What you questions guys? do you have for us? I see some hands yeah, through I see the light. One right yeah. there. As of right now, no. That's actually something from a tower side of things that we're actually adding as a feature in the future. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, and if you didn't catch it, the question was, can you use Ansible Tower with HashiCorp Vault? Uh, it was more of oh. um, the question was, can you utilize the credentials within ah. HashiCorp Vault as a credential within Tower? Right now, no, but that's something that we're working towards. Good. I see a question there. Yeah, a um, little bit more in, in, in the way of moving parts, right? Because you need, obviously, the Ansible binary, the command itself, to be able to run. And you've got to have a way to feed your playbooks or get them somehow onto that machine. So if you can do those two things, either with a shell script or you know, a little wrapper, um, you can run the remote way where all of the Ansible activity is happening on the machine itself, and you're just doing it to local host instead of doing it remotely over SSH. I'm going to defer to Dylan on it. Yeah, that, that would definitely be one thing if it, if it were systems that only had access to like that DMZ, per se. That's, that's one route that you would be taking. It. Another use case that I would be thinking of is when you actually had a Terraform Enterprise system and an Ansible Tower type system. That's the remote exec right there. Um, most of that will be done over API, most likely. But from a callback side of things, there may be some instances where Ansible itself has to be interacted with Terraform itself. So that's, that's that. I think the main use case, though, would be DMZ-related things, like you only have access to that host from that location and that part of the network. Good. That's a good question, though. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. On the Ansible side or on the? That's a good one. I never actually thought of that. Thank you. Um, Output the host name and put it in the inventory? E yeah, but it's, it's more two of, I'm wondering if there's a way that we could leverage enterprise to, to generate a dynamic inventory, because all of the data that's coming from Terraform as the source of truth at that point. That's right. Could, so you, you could, with Terraform Enterprise, have uh, you know, uh, remote workspaces advertising or, or have those outputs available. You could just fetch them with an API call. Yeah, and, and since that API is presenting it in JSON, there's, there's the way that Ansible consumes that data already, right? So it would just be the, the basic key value pairs that would come from any dynamic inventory plugin and put it there. But I, I like that as an idea. That's something that we'll, we'll definitely be talking about together, because I hadn't thought about that. 
Yeah, and if you want, you want to chat some more after, just come and see us after the talk. Any other questions? There's a question yeah. here, here, here. Okay, we'll get to each one. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's pretty much the whole point of this, right? Is is kind of building that awareness and getting people to realize that there is a lot of synergy between the tools. As far as us building those integrations together, that's something that's a work in progress with each other. We're, we've got a full list of roadmapped items as two companies to work towards and start delivering. So you'll start seeing all of that over time as they come. So we've got a request too. to repeat the, each question so okay. for the recording. Got it. Okay, who's next? Question here, and then there was one gentleman in the second Kevin. round. Hi, Sean. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> um, I kind of see this as, as a useful pattern for systems that require shared services, where like you can't get away from just defining your infrastructure as policy, but you still need integration here. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah. So it was more of a statement of this, this is a, a good way to, to prove that there is still value for configuration management outside of system policy or infrastructure as code. Uh, my views on the subject are definitely akin to that. Um, I also, I mean, it, it always gets to the bake versus fry discussion, right? You know, are, are we baking a fully golden image or are we getting all the pieces together and frying it at the end? I'm more of the latter in my past of operations. I feel like it's better to get as much together as you possibly could and build that image and then do your deployments at the end because there is always gonna be that little bit of configuration management you have to do. And then when I think of Ansible at, in the bigger scheme of things, there's more to it than just the systems being set up, right? You have your, your application monitoring you have to do and orchestrate. You have to tell that to set up and set up the alerts for all of that. I, I always think of that bigger picture. And I think from a policy standpoint, that's always one thing that's lacked when it comes to, to, to talking about that policy to you know, your, your actual reviewers of, of your, like, let's say that you're actually about to go public and you need everything reviewed over. Those are some things that are overlooked that I always liked to highlight when I was in operations. I like Kevin's uh, approach because it's very practical. Uh, there are gonna be shared services that you stand up and just leave alone and, and you know, it's important to have good config tools for building and maintaining those things. Would that kind of? Splunk. Splunk, for example, yeah. That's a good one. Sensor. Yeah, there's, right. there's a, I mean, and that's the thing, right, is there are so many tools in this ecosystem that we all have to work with, and it's just a matter of how do you get them all working with each other, and that's kind of the story here today. Good. Yes. Uh, in one of your examples, uh, you had um, Fairphone calling Ansible, and then Ansible calling Ansible, right? Yes. Yep. Um, have you guys given much thought on this? Is there an effective way for Fairphone to call Ansible, and then Fairphone to call Ansible? Good. Okay, so to kind of sum up the question, um, we showed you how to use Ansible and Terraform and Terraform and Ansible, or Ansible to call Terraform and then call Ansible. What are some recommended patterns about how to do that and use, you know, to get the, the most of both tools? Would that kind of... I think one of the most effective ways is that we could actually have an Ansible provisioner. So that's, that's one thing that we're actively working on as two companies and getting that built. All right. So stay tuned for that. Um, along those other lines, I, th I would say it's, it, it's more dogma at that point. I wouldn't necessarily wanna 
prescribed to any person to say to, to use one or the other because it, it really comes down to your actual corporate policies at that point. And there are some cases where users may want to go through Terraform Enterprise as, a, as opposed to Ansible Tower and, and vice versa. It, it, it's really, really specific that I personally wouldn't want to self-prescribe that. But at least from the two, the two tools together, there I'm, are some improvements. I have a question. I'd like to turn this around. Uh, folks who raise their hands for using both Terraform and Ansible, is there anyone calling Terraform with Ansible and doing orchestrating yeah. Terraform runs with Ansible? How many Raise of you are using the Terraform module today? Yeah, I see a hand there. How do you do it? What's it look like? Okay. Great. Okay. Good. So a couple, just to repeat, a couple of options. Uh, they have Terraform uh, calling Jenkins, and then Jenkins will call Ansible, and that way they know if there's a failure in the build. One more? Yeah. I just had, I just had one more note. Okay. Ah, good. Yep. But for Ansible alone, correct. So the, the point was that Terraform Enterprise has a good audit log of, of what's happening in the cloud. I think, uh, you know, we have the same thing to a point in Ansible Tower as well, but that's more just access to, to Tower and, and who is running Ansible jobs in there. But that's, that's more of the data that's shared between the tools. There's a lot that could be done there about getting that data somewhere that can can do it. You know, think of things like Splunk or Elk, right? Going back to that previous discussion, there's there's a lot of work that we can do there together that we're thinking about too. Yeah, very useful for security. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Gentleman in second row had a, had a question. He's been so patient. Uh, so the, the question was, have we used remote exec to call tower and do Ansible? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's actually stuff that we're working on today is, is seeing how we can get Terraform Enterprise to integrate with, with Ansible tower to do that, that callback functionality. Right. Yep. Yep, definitely. I mean, and I also think of it this way, right? You could have Terraform Enterprise call Ansible Tower after those systems are up and running, and then there can be um, that data sent back in that callback to Terraform and say, you know, this is the current state of, of the, the Terraformed world, and this is how all my systems are set up, and this is what's been deployed to them. Yep, totally can see that as an option. See some folks back here. How about you in the Docker shirt? Um, so I was wondering about console integration points. Console integration points with Ansible. Mm -hmm. If I, if I recall correctly, there is somewhere out in the ecosystem that has a, a console inventory, but I think it was a dynamic script. Uh, what I would love to see is somebody in the community actually come out and build an inventory plugin. So for those of you that don't know, there's a, a transition from inventory scripts or dynamic inventory scripts to inventory plugins, and we've, we've kind of, we're remastering the whole Ansible code base to be more plugin based. And what that's giving to you, the end user, is an inventory cache that you can pull data from. And I think things like console will lend to having that cache available to them to, because th that's already dynamic in and of, in of itself, right? And we want to get more data out and usable by the end user in Ansible playbook runs. So that's one thing I would like to see. Uh, there's also a lookup plugin that could be in there as well, just pulling data out. Um, 
I mean, the sky's the limit with console. It's not something that we're actively working on right now because we wanted to, to tackle the, the Terraform provisioner issue first and uh, kind of just tell this story from a Terraform standpoint. But. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the, the statement there was that there's there's also value on the flip side of things is that in an Ansible playbook run, once that's done, the data that came from that you can put back into console. I would even take it further and say HashiCorp Vault is another place yeah. that you can put data into that's been generated. So let's say that a system's been spun up and it has a, a key that's been generated as a part of that. You could throw that into HashiCorp Vault. You know, both come into, into play. It's, it's putting data back into it as well. That's part of orchestrational flow that you can go through and definitely something to think about and what we're working towards. There's another two questions over there. Yeah, fire away. Are we getting a Terraform provider for Ansible Tower? The question was, are we getting a Terraform provider for Ansible Tower? I'm not sure if I understand the question. To, uh, a provisioner or a provider? Ah, uh, I see what you're asking. Um, we haven't talked about that yet, but that's not a bad idea, actually. I'll, I'll go back to the, I'm not the Ansible Tower PM. <laughs> I'm not the Ansible Tower PM, but I'll definitely talk to him about that and see what his thoughts are. Because there's a lot from an Ansible Tower side of things that we're thinking about for, um, I don't want to say federation, but for tower federation on how we manage multiple tower instances to in your environment. And we're taking the Docker approach for that or a container approach. So yeah, I think that's actually a a good idea from from a tower side of things, because we have tower modules. I don't see why we couldn't have Terraform providers for tower as well. So yeah, not a bad idea. Something Any other take questions? Back to arm on the team. Yeah, we'll go badger the people in the purple shirts. Yeah. There was another question back there. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was: Is there a recommended folder structure for your Packer code? Um, I generally like to break it up by cloud or platform, and then I try to put all of the shared files and scripts or playbooks, what have you, into the same folder where you know, each, each of those individual um, Packer templates can reach them. So I'm saying for the remote exec on the Ansible play, oh. when, you're, when you're running the pack, yep. I rem I'm trying to remember mine. I th I think I had them off to the side. So what I what I did at my last job is I actually built uh, new AMIs every single day, and those were CentOS images getting put into Amazon, and I I believe I did have the playbooks in the same repo on the side. Yeah, that is what it was. So we had one large code base. And for our deployment scripts, we had our um, we had three directories. We had a Packer directory, we had a Terraform directory, and then we had a Playbook directory. And then all the roles and everything Playbooks wise lived in there. And then we would just uh, walk our way up to Packer and start building those those AMIs, and then provision them with Terraform, and then go back to Ansible to do the application deployments at that point in time. So that that worked well for me. Um, I will say, just out of personal preference, stay the hell away from Git submodules. But once again, that's dogma. I don't like submodules. That's me. So we're just about at time. We'd like to take one last opportunity to thank you all for coming. Without our users, this conference wouldn't be possible. I think this is the last session for the day. Is that correct? Yeah. Is there one more? <laughs> OK. So pound some coffee and uh, work through the next session. And then come join us in the Tonga Room tonight for a yeah. party sponsored by... Thanks, uh, everybody. Thank you.